I feel that this is kind of like a modern software development practice. It's just it copy is. and paste it. Stack <laughs> Overflow, <laughs> baby. Yeah, that's right. I've done it myself. <laughs> yep. I'm guilty. Yep. So let's talk about a little bit about how can we implement DevSecOps. So I'm going to start from Jeff. And where can we start if you're in a position advising the a program to start DevSecOps? What do you what do you advise? Where we can start implement DevSecOps? Wow. So. I know it's long, but just give it a very high level. <laughs> sure, can. sure, sure. Um, it, it sort of depends on the kind of program. Mm -hmm. Is the government going to be largely developing the code themselves or not? Um, if, if the government's going to be developing the code, then I actually recommend going to an outside consulting expert that does DevSecOps well. There's There are companies out there. In fact, I called you several weeks ago and said, yep. Hassan, I need a list of companies that, that does DevSecOps <laughs> training that can help us stand things up. So I recommend going to an outside, asking for help from somebody else. It, you can learn this on your own. Uh, I mean, there's tons of great stuff on the web to learn this on your own, but you shouldn't have to if you've got budget to, to, to start up rapidly. Um, the other one is, is partnering with a company that's already doing it. I think part of the success Kessel Run has had is they were able to get up and going very quickly because they partnered with a company like Pivotal, Pivotal mm -hmm. Labs that, that was really good at it and able to train their people more rapidly. I think that was a good way to go. Um, Another way would be, I think we should, if, if you're not, if the government's not going to develop the software themselves, but we are going to outsource the development, I think we need to look really hard at non-traditional defense industrial based companies. Yeah. Companies that are actually good at software. Mm -hmm. I, I was toying with this idea, we're rewriting the 5,000 series of regulations right now, and I was re toying with this idea, with your, the acquisition regulations, of saying you're not allowed to buy software from a company that doesn't actually have a successful commercial software product. Not, not one that they've only sold the government, but, but has demonstrated that they actually could produce useful software that the general public wants. And right. I don't think that'll ever fly, but, but that, that's my point, is, is our traditional industrial-based companies, and I'll never get a job with any of them after I say this, but I've said this dozens of times already. Our traditional industrial-based companies have not demonstrated that they're good at software at scale. They just have not done that. But yet we go back to them time and again to buy our software, and I think we should look for an alternative Unless they demonstrate they can be better. Got it. <laughs> Nick, what's your position of uh, implementing DevSecOps? Where we should start? Like any steps that you can advise for the programs? Well, assuming you got the talent, right, which is what Jeff was t talking about, the training and the talent. You just can't just wake up in the morning and say, you know, I'm going to stop doing DevSecOps today with zero, zero training, right? You need, you need to make that move from waterfall to agile and, and DevSecOps. And if you're still stuck at waterfall, hopefully you can jump all the way to DevSecOps and not be stuck in agile. <laughs> and, and so for me, I think it comes to the tech again. I'm a tech guy, so I love, I love tech. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, really helping in the adoption and making it as simple as possible for the developers, right? So if you bring them a service mesh, you bring them a CICD pipeline, and you make it easy for them to write microservices, they can focus on their mission and not actually build load balancing, high availability containers, and having to figure out how to do A-B testing and routing and all the good stuff that your ECO service mesh will be able to do for you. And same thing for the testing side of the house and the, the cyber side of the house. If you bring them a CICD pipeline with all the, the tools for multiple programming languages like Java, Python, Go, C, C++, whatever you want to use, uh, you facilitate that option. And so because our entire uh, infrastructure is based on top of CNCF Kubernetes and OCI compliant containers, we are hardening containers in DoD and creating a central repository of containers uh, that anyone can come and use. And we're going to be supporting 100 plus containers uh, so people can not only stand up the CACD pipeline with the push of a button using Helm and, and Kubernetes, uh, but also use containers for the application layers as well, like databases, API gateways, service mesh, and things like that. So as a summary, we're expecting program manager or program, they will develop their own DevSecOps pipeline, working with the partner, and then taking advantage of the DOD is offering up centralized artifact catalog, which is a container, so we can help them to get the ATO process. Yeah, and I would actually like, eventually, so I would like a lot of program managers to not have to develop their own pipeline, to, to have an enterprise level offering of, mm -hmm. of several different kinds of pipelines. One's good for a business system, one's good for um, a safety critical system, Safe one's missions. good for um, one that's heavy in machine learning, and have some of these pipelines pre available. They can tweak them as they see fit, but 
we shouldn't, we, we reinvent the wheel every time. Um, I agree. There was this massive software project that is done out in the western part of the US that they decided to build their own platform from scratch in 2012 rather than just look to the emerging cloud and capabilities that they had there. And so that they spent years and years and hundreds of millions of dollars reinventing a platform that they didn't have to invent, in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So we need to swallow our pride and use the stuff that's there. Or using a cloud technologies as a baseline, adding a DevSecOps thought and process into the cloud and yeah. and taking advantage of it. Because there is, I'm going to challenge a bit on you, Jeff. Sure. There's no way we can get a one DevSecOps pipeline with every program. I completely agree. Right. Totally agree. Yeah, I completely it's, agree with it you. It may change from an architecture perspective. Mm -hmm. It may change for their tech stack. It may change eventually. Yeah, I completely agree. And and what, what we need to do is build an environment where it can continuously adapt and learn as change That's is needed. Point. You're, adapt, you're, yeah. You know what I mean? So, because there's, and the things that are hot today aren't going to be hot. Uh, there's something else out there, right? Yeah. What's after DevSecOps? I mean, I know. I mean, we went from virtual machines. It took, man, it took like a decade for DOD to figure out that virtualization was a good thing. Right? And now containers are already almost passe and we're at, at function as a service thing. and serverless. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. And we're still talking about trying to get a con, con, things containerized. You know, so you know, what, what's, what's the next thing on there? I don't know. I don't know. But It's going to be service architecture. Yeah. It's going to be AI machine learning with respect to DevSecOps or DevOps. Just calling it maybe AI apps or something else. Yeah. Yep. I mean, the, but there is there is something out there, right? right. That means and we should be ready for continuously evaluate our environment, be ready yes. for new changes. Yes, and so that's where we need to get to, so that change doesn't frighten us so much, and we can keep up.